Hello everyone, and welcome to a very special Kerbal Space Program video. That's right, today marks the spectacular, the stupendous, the stratospheric, the something similar starting with S, return of life on Lathe. As promised, I said I would revisit this series once Lathe got a texture revamp, and it seems many of you remembered this if the comment section of the update video is anything to go by, and so here we are. But you know, it has been an awfully long time since the last episode of this series. In fact, we've had an entirely new DLC release in the interim, and I've since migrated over to a new save file that doesn't even have any of the infrastructure that we put in place last time we played on this series last year. And so with that, I have made the executive decision that the best course of action is to simply yeet all of our previous progress and begin afresh. But we'll be setting our sights far higher than the ambitions of the first season of Life on Lathe. Now that we have rotors and robotics, we'll be able to make some pretty cool vehicles, drones and bases as we commence our interstellar colonization of Jules' dampest moon. But first, we need to perform a reconnaissance mission of Lathe to properly assess its atmosphere and to establish a good location for a surface base. Enter this small drone I'm building here. I've called it the Dragonfly, in tribute to NASA's proposed probe of the same name that they hope to land on Titan by 2034. It's a mission that I'm very excited for, actually, as Titan could potentially be the home of extraterrestrial life, and much like Lathe, it sports an atmosphere that permits flight, hence why we've got these cooler helicopter designs. <laughs> actually, the similarities don't end there. It's clear that Lathe was created as an analogue of Titan for KSP. Titan is the largest moon of Saturn and the second largest moon in the entire solar system, which pretty much aligns with Lathe, although you have to swap Saturn for Joule, obviously. Furthermore, it's the only known moon to have a, have a dense atmosphere and the only known body in space, aside from Earth, of course, where there is clear evidence of stable bodies of a surface liquid. Hopefully you can share my excitement for the Dragonfly mission and, of course, any other subsequent missions launched to Titan in the future. For my mission, I really didn't want to skimp on our scientific horsepower for the sake of making a one-to-one -one recreation of the NASA probe, so this doesn't bear all that much visual semblance to the NASA Dragonfly. Instead, I've added these two little bug eyes to the front to help embrace the Dragonfly name, and it contains almost every single science unit available to us, so we can perform a comprehensive analysis of Lathe's overworld and decide what sort of craft we need to make and incorporate into our colonization effort. I've constructed this fairing structure around it to mimic the deployment sequence of Dragonfly. We have a UFO-esque looking structure that will shield the probe during atmospheric entry. Once we've reached safe speeds, the top mounted parachute will deploy and the lower ablative heat shield will fall away, allowing the Dragonfly to unfold its landing skis, fire up its rotors and drop away from the descent housing. My plan was to have it so like the fairing structure that forms the upper protective housing stays intact during the probe separation, just like the real NASA mission will probably do. But uh, annoyingly, for some reason, the drone wouldn't separate from the fairing base unless the fairing structure was deployed as well. So that is one area of, admittedly, like I say, quite a few <laughs> ways in which this mission differs from NASA's plan. The rocket that will carry our probe to Lathe, that you can see me building here isn't really based on anything. <laughs> the actual Dragonfly mission will likely ride aboard an Atlas V or equivalent when it comes to launching it for real, but I've gone with this stumpy looking fella just because it gets the job done and in order to have the shape I wanted for the payload I was stuck with having to use the 3.75 meter parts for the stack which is wildly overpowered for our payload's very low mass. But you know what, despite this, I, I'm pretty happy with how the rocket ended up looking. Uh, I think it has a nice, unique look that not many KSP rockets have. You know, I'm often building these ludicrous behemoths in this game. It's sometimes nice to make, make a, uh, a, I don't know if it's a realistic scale, but it's a slightly smaller scale than what I usually build. It's a little bit more of a relaxed pace, and I do like using the mainsail engine after it got its revamp. I really, really like that, uh, tr that triple nozzle look. I know only one nozzle is the actual engine, the other two are the turbo pump exhausts I believe, but it still has three flames coming out the bottom and that's what I like. It just looks cooler. We can see that for ourselves as we cut along to the launch. Now I have a service bay uh, just above the poodle engine of the upper stage that contains a pro core just to give us a control point that points in the direction of our center of thrust. Uh, controlling from the Dragonfly would be very, very difficult because the nav ball position would be placed horizontally rather than, you know, like I say, in line with the center 
of thrust. Or, you know, to simplify it even further, a control point that points up. Uh, that's why when I'm designing a lot of my more wacky crafts that don't necessarily have a control point dead center, I sometimes stick a junior-sized uh, docking port somewhere in the middle just to have as my control point. Didn't do that in this case, I just stuck an SAS probe core there because why not? We've got money to burn. This is life on lathe. Gosh darn it, we're not sparing any expense on this expedition. As we are... Uh, uh, speaking of expense, we have just expended our expendable solid rocket motors. I mean, this whole rocket is expendable, to be fair, except for hopefully the Dragonfly. I would very much like that to not be expended. But regardless, as you can see, we are punching our way through the upper atmosphere. You can see those flames licking the edges of the fairing as we push our way past the thickest part of the atmosphere. And we can begin to throttle down as we enter the final thinnest parts of the... I feel like I've said the word atmosphere too many times now in this paragraph. But you know what I mean? We're, we're nearly in space, was the uh, the long and short of that. In fact, we're so close to space, we may as well deploy the fairings right about now. Because the atmospheric drag is so insignificant at this altitude. And then we can just coast our way up to Apoapsis. We can begin our circularization burn using the last of our uh, first stage fuel reserves. And then we'll complete our circularization using the upper poodle stage, which is actually going to be the same stage that gets us all the way to lathe orbit. Uh, and we're not going to leave anything stuck in space. That's why I wanted to use this stage. I was in, I wanted this lower stage to run out of fuel before we actually entered a stable orbit so that it would crash harmlessly down into uh, Kerbin's oceans. Uh, I'd be recovered, hopefully, maybe, if I remember. <laughs> uh, but either way, not leave it stuck in space. These space polar bears, of course, are an endangered species. I don't think I've ever seen one ever, right? That's how rare they are. So we really don't want to be leaving fuel tanks floating around. Uh, much better to just send them slamming into the ocean. I think we can all agree. But there we are. We are circularized around Kerbin. And at this point, I remembered that I hadn't actually checked if Kerbin was in an optimal location to launch a mission to Joule, which it isn't. You know, the optimal transfer window to get to Joule would be if you were to draw a line from Kerbin to the sun to Joule, the angle it would form at the sun would form, a, it would be an angle, <laughs> I don't know what that was, it would be an angle of about 101 degrees. And uh, what I've got here, I don't know, what do we think that is, 85 degrees? Either way, uh, it was a little bit too late. I needed to launch a bit earlier in the year <laughs> uh, for this launch to be optimal, but it doesn't matter. We've got enough Delta V to... Uh, brute force our way through it so it's not going to be a problem we'll just spend a little bit more delta v so that we can launch right away without having to wait for the rest of 2020 to happen because who wants to rush through this year huh <sighs> and there we are uh, i like i say i like to um can cancel out the maneuver nodes just before i get my planetary encounters because the maneuver nodes prediction is never dead on so when you're about to complete the projected burn i just like to close off the little burn indicator and watch the grey indication markers myself and cancel out the burn when ex exactly when I want to cancel out the burn, basically. The maneuver node doesn't always get it dead on. Uh, the second part of our mission will be to plan out our uh, interstellar correction burn. It's very hard to get the inclination right straight out of Kerbin, so I do a quick uh, anti-normal correction halfway to the green planet just to bring our alignment down to Tylo's level because I know I said earlier we've got plenty of Delta V. We haven't actually got enough Delta V to do this mission without any sort of gravity assist, but it's very common practice to uh, do Tylo gravity assists for any dual missions. So that's what we're going to do here. Tylo is great. It is a massive, massive celestial body, so it has lots of nice gravity that we can milk <laughs> and to get captured into a dual orbit. Basically, you want to bring your orbital line down such that your periapsis just kisses. Tylo's orbit and that's where you want to encounter Tylo around your periapsis point doesn't have to be dead on just somewhere near periapsis preferably just before periapsis and get your Tylo encounter once you've got a Tylo encounter just focus in on Tylo just try and move your orbital line close to its surface and then my recommendation would be to just zoom out and see how it influences your orbit around Joule and then you can just play around with the maneuver node until you get something to this effect here actually that was a bad time to bring your attention back to the screen because i messed it up i overshot so i had to do a quick uh, reverse burn just here to bring it back to where we were before i continued burning unnecessarily and that's what we have here my biggest uh, one of the biggest things i get asked or one of the most common requests i receive is uh you know can you make a video on how to do gravity assists and 
gravity assists I find are really really difficult things to summarize because I I just taught myself how to do gravity assists I didn't look at a tutorial the thing I would just say to you if you're wanting a gravity assist tutorial is to just try and do them you know like go to jewel try and do this get a tylo gravity assist to capture around jewel you can very quickly get a feeling for how encounters with celestial bodies will affect your subsequent orbit you know you kind of get a feel for it like i say and then it just becomes intuitive like you just got to do it enough basically what i'm saying is to get better at the game you just have to practice playing the game that's that that would be my recommendation if you just play ksp lots and try things out you might just find that you become a better player I mean, that's how I became quote-unquote good at KSP. I, some people might disagree with that, but I like to think I'm at least somewhat competent at this video game by this point. And one of the ways I kind of became a better player earlier on was just I kept pushing myself. When really looking back, I was like, you really weren't ready to try that. It's like, as soon as I land, as soon, as soon like the second I got a uh, low curb in orbit for the first time, I was like, right, how do I do a Mun mission? And then like, right, how do I do a Minmus mission? How do I do a Juno mission? How do I do just, I just kept doing things at a really rapid rate. And, uh, you know, eventually you just get the knack, so to speak. I mean, obviously Scott Manley was a very helpful co-pilot to have in those early days when I was learning the game. So thank you, Scott. I'm sure I'm not the only one who owes my <laughs> abilities in KSP to your, uh, your tutorials. It's a real shame that a lot of... Uh, quite a few of Scott Manley's tutorials are unfortunately a bit out of date now because of the various changes that Kerbal Space Program has gone through, especially uh, things like the atmosphere of Kerbin. But, you know, basic things like, you know, gravity assist, I'm sure he's, I don't even know if he's done videos, but to this day, I still recommend the Scott Manley tutorial on how to rendezvous because I don't think I could really do a better video than what he did, so I'm not even going to bother trying. If you want to learn how to rendezvous ships in low Kerbin orbit, just Google or go YouTube search or just, just go on Bing <laughs> and type in uh, Scott Manley Rendezvous Tutorial. And it's it's really good. He walks you through it. It's far more coherent than the rambling mess that my commentaries tend to devolve into. And look at that. We have captured around late. I didn't talk about anything. But I, I feel like I am the sort of person that lets the video do the talking. Because I sure as heck cannot. Now, you can see I've crossfaded across here. I quickly exited out of KSP, deleted all my visual mods just so I could more easily see the surface of lathe and get a better feel for where would be a good spot to land our drone and I thought this little cluster of islands would be a good candidate for a location to launch our uh, colonization of the moon just because everywhere else is either just water <laughs> or very very uh, scarcely scattered islands I did think about going for that other cluster on the other side of the moon just there it was like lots of little islands all very far apart but I thought this you know area of um, this this sort of grouping of land masses land mass I I don't actually know what the uh, the plural of land mass is but uh, you know regardless these islands these islands okay that would have been better can I just rewind uh, it's all right we're gonna press on we're gonna press on it's Friday night and I haven't eaten yet. I'm getting very hungry, guys. So I'm going to create a maneuver though that will get us on a landing to one of the islands. I thought that island there looked good because it was along the equator and so it would be easy to land on. And then I uh, exited out of the game, reinstalled my visual mods, and here we are. So we're going to do our retrograde burn just to get ourselves deorbited. And haven't got much fuel left in that stage, but luckily it has now served its purpose. We can d detach it and... Uh there we are, and we can take a look at that, like I say, very UFO-esque re-entry structure. I don't, shouldn't say re-entry, right, because we're not re-entering Lathe's atmosphere, but atmospheric entry structure, uh, and it's very similar to how the Dragonfly's structure would look. And, you know, it's very similar to, for example, like the Curiosity rover uh, that landed on Mars, had, a, had an enclosure like this. Uh, everyone thought that was quite funny and ironic that the first flying saucer... Uh, was sent from Earth and landed on Mars. <laughs> um, that's that, that's that, that's all I had to say about that, really. Now, ablative heat shields in this game are very, very powerful. I didn't really need that ablative shield at all, particularly because I was coming from low lathe orbit. But it's nice to have, A, from a realistic standpoint, and also because if you, uh, if you didn't quite get things as efficient as I did, and you end up running out of fuel before you kind of circularize at lathe, you could just 
use that shield to do your lathe circularization and subsequent deorbit without having to worry about using an engine. You can save, you can save a few hundred. Hang on, what was, what was my circularization burn? Like 600 meters per second? I have no idea, I can't remember. You can just rewind the video and you can see. But it was expensive burn nonetheless. Second most expensive burn after our initial Kerbal uh, escape burn. But there goes the lower shield. We can lower the landing skis. Completely pointless, but that's what the real dragonfly dragonfly. Hopefully it won't dragonfly. Hopefully it will dragonfly. What a what a happy accident there. Uh, it will just drop its legs down like that. So I thought we'll do the same for this, and then we can separate it away from the upper housing. Which, like I say, I wanted that to remain in one piece as we dropped away. But unfortunately, for whatever reason, uh, the probe just wouldn't separate if the uh, fairing didn't. Uh, break apart uh, and it wasn't and it wasn't someone might say that it's because part of the drone was clipping into it but it wasn't I checked I've zoomed right in and looked at every single nook and cranny of the uh, the probe and it wasn't touching the fairing at all so I'm not quite sure what was happening I think it was just one of those weird physics quirks of KSP but it's it's a minor it's a minor annoyance I'm not gonna get too far into it hey presto look at that our probe is flying freely we can go and land somewhere. I'm going to speed the footage up, right? I feel like you've now seen it flying in real time. You get the picture. Let's not waste anyone's time. Let's get down to the ground and uh, take a look at our surroundings. Now, you may have noticed that this thing is lacking solar panels, so you might be getting worried at this point that our electric charge is quite quickly plummeting down and we don't have any obvious means of replenishing that. But worry not, we do in fact have an RTG clipped close to the, set, close to the front of the craft, I should say, just behind the... Uh, eyes, the, the lights that are meant to look like little eyes, and that's going to supply our batteries with limitless electricity and ensure that we can sustain flight forever. The only drawback is it can't recharge the batteries uh, faster than the uh, propellers will drain them, so we will have to intermittently land this thing just to allow it to regain its electric charge. We do have fairly limited range. I'm not sure, I, I'm really not convinced though, that we could actually get to any other island aside from this one. So that's that's one drawback of this thing. So as you can see, we touched that. I like how I'm now going to talk about what we just did after it happened because I was talking about some random tangent. But then we touched down, ran some science, but I really want to use that scanning arm on the quote unquote tail of this probe, which means we've got to go and find a breaking ground surface feature, which by gosh, there is one there, it's a pink boulder. Lathe has two surface features uh, that came with breaking ground. One are these pink rocks here. The other are the little geezers, as in like, you know, the water volcanoes. Um, so we're gonna go find one of those after we've looked at this, but let's try and be thorough. Let's, we're gonna try and do a thorough, complete analysis of everything we could possibly find on Lathe. Who knows, maybe this thing is made of diamonds. And so it would be a useful thing to know about so we can establish some sort of rover system to harvest these rocks when we do our colonization in a future video. So as you can see, uh, this thing is actually quite difficult to control. I probably should have tested this rover a little bit more. I don't know what to call it because it's not a rover, right? I should have. I probably should have tested this drone a little bit more uh, thoroughly than I did. I just said, oh, cool, it can fly. Let's launch it. I didn't really test landing it at, spe at precise spots, which turns out is pretty difficult. Uh, I won't lie to you guys, I'm not actually that familiar with rotors in this game, like how to use them. Uh, is there a way you can get the Cal 9000 controller to uh, be able to throttle rotors up and down using shift and control? I'm not quite sure. Maybe there is. If there is, that's probably something I should have done. But this way works, you know, basically just have them run at full speed and just tap the B button on the keyboard to activate and deactivate the brakes to get some sort of speed control. So as you can see, this thing slid about a bit and that scanning arm can't run unless the vessel is staying still. So I had to uh, raise the landing skis just there to make sure we didn't slide about and could complete our scan of the rocks and the game very passively aggressively tells us that we should have brought a bigger scanning arm. So thanks game, duly noted for when we do our uh, subsequent missions to later, later on. Um, Actually, I was going to say that worked out quite nicely, didn't it? I said earlier that those, uh, the fact that those landing skis unfold is a pointless feature. It's only there to closer match the aesthetic of the NASA probe. But hey, turns out they did have a useful use. Uh, now we're going to go and look for another surface feature. I kind of uh, skipped ahead a little bit to so save you guys the, uh, the tedium of flying this thing around in real time. And there is a geezer there. Look at that thing. Shooting 
whatever that is, milk probably, I'm, I'm guessing that's what it is, <laughs> into the air. We can now try and very, very haphazardly and awkwardly try and touch down close to it. I'd say that's close enough. That's probably the grace at which NASA would launch, would, would land their very, very fragile and expensive drone. And we can perform an analysis here. I did say earlier that this thing has slightly more bells and whistles than the NASA Dragonfly, but for those interested, uh, the NASA Dragonfly will conduct its science by landing at a site and firing a pulse neutron generator and onboard gamma ray sensor to detect key elements such as carbon and hydrogen in organic material or oxygen in water ice. It can see if there are any well-defined layers of these materials below its landing spite, landing spite, landing site, and if there are, it can deploy its onboard drill to extract some surface samples. These can then be analyzed by its onboard mass spectrometer to obtain all sorts of information about the chemical components present within the Titans. Within the Titans, great. This isn't God of War or. I guess Greek mythology, <laughs> present within Titan's frozen surface. Uh, my dragonfly works, I nearly said dragonfly again, why is dragonfly such a difficult word to say? My dragonfly works a little differently, like I say, it's, it's basically just a massive battery with all the science units sort of bolted to the side. What a beautiful shot of that geezer spout just there, but that's the dragonfly, and like I say, it is one of the most, I'm, I'm very, very excited. Uh, to see the Dragonfly mission, if it ever launches, which hopefully it will. Um, I'd also like to see possibly like some sort of submarine expedition on Titan as well, which has been mentioned. I remember reading about something like this in school, and I didn't bother researching it for this video, but I'm assuming someone somewhere at some point has thought about maybe doing that in real life. So we can dream. Uh, I did notice just here that our electric charge was getting a little bit low, so we did a quick landing here just so we can allow that RTG to recharge it, and then we can start our flight once again, and I thought, you know what? I th I said earlier that I'm not convinced that this thing can do island hops because it will just run out of fuel before it reaches the next island, but hey, maybe it, KSP's buoyancy can sometimes work in people's favor. Maybe we can actually just land on the surface of the water and recharge, thereby leaving no scrap of land on this whole moon out of range. For this little drone. So that's what we're going to try here. We're going to just very gradually navigate ourselves downward towards the surface of the water. I must point out that the water is not part of the lathe texture revamp. Unfortunately, this is still part of the scatterer mod. KSP water, please can that not suck, squad? Just, just, just use scatterer. It's here. Someone's already done it. Just pay him some money, and then it'll be in the game. And same for clouds, actually. Clouds, why aren't why aren't they in the game, squad? Come on, squad, please, please. Okay, whatever. We can now get to the moment where we touch down. So, yes, we've raised those landing skis. We could just slowly touch down. And look at that. And we actually started to sink. So I was like, oh, great. This thing works really well as a submarine. So we can test, we, could, we can perform an analysis <laughs> of uh, the underlayth as well to see the feasibility of any sort of uh, aquatic bases. But then I reached the sad realization that although this thing can submerge, it's, uh, well, it's rotors, they can't overcome the sink, the sinkingness. And as you can see, despite us having those propellers spinning at full whack, our altitude gauge is still descending. So kind of a sad ending, really. Look, oh, he's trying to kick its flippers to get to the surface. Oh, and now it's looking up, uh, desperation, looking for help. Oh, oh, it's so sad. Oh, no. You could do it. You could do it, little drone. Oh, no, that's not going to help. That's this not helping. Oh, no, oh, it's just getting desperate. It's losing. Oh, it, it's becoming disoriented. Oh, dear. Oh. Oh. And the salt, the salt got to it. And that was, that was, that was the, that was the life. That was the life of a little dragonfly that could. <laughs> the little dragonfly that would get us to lathe. And it's given us lots of information. Guys, can I get an F in chat? Can I get an F in chat? And then on screen, you could maybe have a look at some more videos. And like this one, I feel like I should say that more often. And uh, and that's it. I don't, I've got nothing else to say. 